for those who don't know me, my name is Ted Helms. I'm the Executive Director of the Chamber. Uh, very simply, our mission to promote trade, investment, and understanding uh, between Brazil and the U.S. Uh, in the case of tax, okay. where that needs a lot of understanding, so uh, I think it's very positive. Uh, we have done other tax events, but my experience is also complicated. You get every every three to six months, you have to do an event on tax just to kind of uh, get uh, an understanding of it. I want to thank uh, Mimi and uh, Aaron Schreier. They're uh, members of the committee. That are, we have a trade investment committee, and they come together and suggest ideas, and so that's what's the, the genesis of that, and then they bring in their colleagues uh, and, and get going. But in the United States, we don't have a lot of rules that are black and white. You have to look at everything from what is the substance of the transaction. Um, we have various principles of substance over form, and one I explain to clients is, for the moment, when they come for advice and we're done to do the tax returns and working with some of my colleagues to give them advice, I first look at them and they give me an alert chart and they give me everything that everyone does and they say, okay, so this is what it is. What's the U.S. tax implications? My first question is, what is it you're trying to do here? Forget the agreements between the entities, forget the structures. What is it you're really trying to accomplish? Once we know that, I can tell you, regardless of the structure, what the U.S. tax implications are going to be. Because if you ever get examined, that's the first thing you're going to look to do. If you ever have to go to court, which God forbid you don't want to do that in the United States with the tax system, they're going to first look at what is it that's actually happening here. The biggest thing I get when I have inbound transactions is that well, what do you mean that the states have a separate level? I know Brazil has their states and they have some of their own stuff, but here it can be even more complicated because the states have their own rules, their own definitions. Some tie in with the federal law, some do not. Okay, so you have to be very careful. Um, and you have to look at whatever you're doing in whatever states, especially real estate. If you start owning property in different states, you're going to be subject to tax there. And it's going to be their rules that are going to apply. And some of the biggest things is here in the U.S., you have depreciation, especially if it's, you know, you're really renting it out, things like that. Every state has their own different depreciation rules. So it can be complicated. Individual ownership. Not really recommended if it's of any real value, as I just said, because you not only have the income tax issues to deal with, but if you die owning it, it's going to be a huge estate tax that you're going to have to give over to the U.S. government. Um, and they, they do look at these very much, okay? The estate tax is not actually a huge revenue generator for the United States. It's actually very small, but they do enforce it very strictly. U.S. single member LLC, again, not recommended because from a U.S. tax standpoint, and I know in many countries, my Brazilian clients have told me, and I've read the rules, a U.S. LLC is treated as a corporation for Brazilian tax purposes. It is not disregarded in any fashion, okay? Um, some of our clients have switched over to limited partnerships in order to get that same Brazilian treatment. So here, again, the single member for U.S. tax purposes is disregarded. So it's the same as if you own it directly. You can get a lot of legal benefits from having the LLC in place, but there are no tax benefits. U.S. corporate structure, you can, you can get the U.S. estate and gift tax is imposed on an individual, not a company. But if you're not a U.S., if you're a non-U.S. person and you own shares of a company or some sort of interest in a company, that's U.S. property and it's subject to estate and gift tax. So this you know, again, depending on the facts and circumstances which you're dealing with a client, this may work for that, okay? But from a tax planning standpoint, it's still probably not the best structure. Foreign corporation works a little better. There are, again, various reporting requirements that, you know, are going to need to be done with, can be some significant penalties if those international information returns and transparency are late or not properly disclosed. Um, so the U.S. does have some significant penalties to basically tell you, listen, tell us, even if there's no income. And I, I want to repeat this because I hear it so many times. 
I didn't report it because there's no income. There's no taxable income. The U.S. government does not care. You better tell them about it. If you are a U.S. taxpayer resident of any kind and you're subject to U.S. tax, okay, and you have any kind of interest, it could be half a percent in a foreign entity, foreign financial account, or anything of that nature, you better report, regardless if there's any income. If you do not, there are significant penalties. One of them is what we call, you may have heard of, is our foreign bank and financial account report. That starts at 10000 If they find that you willfully disregarded the rules, it can go to $50,000 a year per account. And if they feel that you really were willful, they can take 50% of that of each account. Okay, it's a penalty. And we have a lot of court cases right now that are showing that the US government is taking a stance on this and they're taking it. A trust is usually the best and or foreign corporation. I know again in civil law jurisdictions, trusts are they're becoming known. But it's kind of like, what do you mean I'm going to hand over everything I work for to somebody who can basically sign it all away, okay? Well, we do have rules here that protect that, but I get it, okay? It's a control issue. Well, we also have here now what they call directed trusts, which help that. They have their own little problems as well. But simply, the last three as a general rule are probably your best structuring measures, okay? What is an opportunity zone? Well, it's new legislation that provides a tax incentive to invest in economically depressed or low-income areas. And the idea is to pull in investment in these areas and, and help you know, spur um, the economies there. And the way that it works is it, some technicals about which legislation, what I'm thinking basically the governor of every state can designate zones as opportunity zones. And once a zone is designated as such, then an investment in that zone, qualifying investment in that zone, provides certain federal income tax benefits for the investor. So how, how does it generally all work? Well, capital gains that a, a U.S. taxpayer has can be invested or rolled over into an opportunity zone, and, and if you do that, you can get certain income tax benefits. So it could be any capital gain, it could be short-term capital gain, long-term capital gain, capital gain from the sale of stocks, bonds, real estate, whatever it is, a business, it doesn't matter, you can take that gain, you can invest in an opportunity zone, um, and you get certain tax benefits. Those benefits are temporary deferral of U.S. income taxes. So you don't have to pay income tax on that gain that you rolled over to the opportunity zone investment until either you sell the investment or the end of, of 2026, whichever comes first. In addition, you get a reduction of the tax that you have to pay. So if you hold that investment for five years, you reduce the federal income tax on that gain that you rolled over by 10%. If you hold it for seven years, you reduce it by another 5%. So at the end of seven years, um, or 2026, again, depending on the timing, you can not only defer your tax until that period, you can also get up to a 15% reduction in the tax due. And that's a very nice benefit, but it's similar to 1031 exchanges. If anyone has ever heard of a 1031 exchange where you can defer gains on the sale of real estate, you roll it over. This works the same way, but there is actually a deadline, so you can't defer indefinitely. The biggest benefit, at least in my opinion, is this permanent deferral that's allowed. So if you invest in an opportunity zone and you keep that investment for more than 10 years and then you sell it, any appreciation in the opportunity fund investment is going to be free of U.S. tax completely. So the big question is, is this available to foreign investors? The answer is, under certain circumstances, yes, it is. And if there's a, a non-U.S. investor, Brazilian uh, family office or individual that has capital gains that are subject to U.S. can't invest directly in an opportunity zone. So you can't have an individual go and buy a building in an opportunity zone. They have to invest through an opportunity zone fund or a QOF, uh, as it's commonly called. A QOF can be a partnership or it can be a corporation. It can even be a REIT, actually, that gets mind numbly complicated. 
But most that, that is, I've worked on are partnerships. But for a foreign investor, it might make some sense to use a corporation because of some of the reasons that Jack mentioned, you get some of those blocker benefits. But there's flexibility. So the first piece of advice we give all of our investment professionals, all of our real estate investors and owners is though opportunity zones do have tax benefits and they are limited time, there's a limited time period for the investments, you have to make sure it's a good real estate investment to begin with. Because if you're not going to see any gains on it, it might not make sense to make that investment to begin with. One of the other things I just want to mention on that topic is one of the gray areas that still exists in the opportunity zone. Um, funds and, and investments is we don't fully know what the penalties are if you don't qualify or you false qualify. So people have been very hesitant to place some of this money because they don't know what the what the ramifications are if you don't hit all of your qualifications and all of your thresholds. And there's what just it's a that there at least up until a few months ago, there was a lot of hesitancy because of the lack of guidance. But if you look at the actual code provision, it's a couple of pages all these substantially words like substantially and with no real definitions and then you had regs come out about a year ago and then more regs come out a few months ago and it wasn't until the second set of regs when, when it started becoming more concrete a lot of the questions that were being asked by, by you know, tax practitioners and real estate people were now answered by the regulations to some extent but you know you guys know that you can sort of structure an investment in a million different ways people get very very creative and even with the existing regs, there are still a lot of gray areas. Can I do this? Can we get a question of it? Can I do this? Can I do that? So there's a little bit of uncertainty about you know, what you can do other than the very traditional investment. And up until very recently, that was making people not want to get into this unknown quagmire protection. We tended on having most of the opportunities. The idea behind it was having neighborhoods that need the investment and need some help. And, um, Truthfully, there are a wide spectrum of neighborhoods, including the Lower East Side is one of the largest um, opportunity zones in New York, in that uh, Long Island City that already had a ton of development. So these, these areas were determined really two, three years ago, the governor started putting in uh, suggestions. Some of these areas have already changed. So there is a broad spectrum, and there does there is business risk with it, but I think the underlying risk of it, because most of the investment is real estate, is making sure the real estate deal makes sense one way or another, and not over underwriting overly aggressively because it isn't an opportunity, opportunity zone. And we're seeing that on the transaction side because we're not getting a, a quantifiable premium on assets in opportunity zones. We're getting you know, market offers and market transactions, but definitely seeing more activity. Um, and, and to an assessor's um, point, there's really only six, seven months to fully take advantage of this. And if you're a real estate professional and you're doing investments in New York, you understand that it takes four, six, seven months, nine months to get an investment, um, you know, to, to really start to finish the close on an investment. So there has been a, a bit of a rush in the last few months because of that. And there were some purchases, I'm not going to call it any specifically, that we think probably overpaid and probably took too big of a risk because of the opportunity. So.